thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. John Nutty. Um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule, John, to come and, and speak for us. Um, John and I were talking before we got started here, so I've been doing my work for 34 years, and uh, I had started at Hitchcock, and um, John started shortly after I did, and uh, we won't use any numbers, but I'll just tell you that I graduated with a bachelor's in physical therapy, which you can't do anymore, you have to have a doctorate now. So all the people we hire now have doctorates, but I had a bachelor's, and uh, so we've known each other for that long. And uh, uh, I was a, a resident um, intern and resident at the time. And my wife was also in the mix um, in uh, beginning the hand clinics over with John and the other staff over at Hitchcock. So uh, we've both been around the block a little bit, and it's a great pleasure to uh, have you speak tonight uh, on your topic of rotator cuff. John, uh, you've got a tremendous amount of experience. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. I can actually be a little more specific. I met Billy and Ruth back when I had hair. But we've been, uh, I've had a great deal of respect for both of them. Ruth was actually the first hand therapist with whom I worked when I finished my fellowship at, uh, at Harvard. So, we go way back. Um, so, it's a pleasure. I'm, I was, was pleased when Billy asked me to talk. and. I see a lot of familiar faces yeah. here. So those of you who know me know that I'm extremely informal. And I thought that the format that might be appropriate tonight is though we're sitting in my office talking about things. So what I'm going to say is basically what a lot of people have already heard when they've come to see me. So my goal is really to try and clear up some of the confusion about rotor cuff injuries, which I, which I hear about all the time. So uh, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, there is even some controversy about things, so I hope I can give you some information and uh, help people who are struggling with decision making to make some decisions. And I always think that, I, I work with a lot of residents and I work with uh, medical students, and I always feel that rather than telling them something, if they know the reasoning behind things, that it will last longer and make more sense to them. And I think that it's helpful to understand the basics, and I had a mentor long ago who uh, told me that uh, anatomy is destiny. So we always start with the anatomy. And this is a what's called a coronal section, which means it's a, a drawing through the shoulder in this plane. And if we start with the, uh, with the bone here, the round part of the bone is the quote unquote ball. It's actually the head of the humerus. And this portion of the bone here is the socket or the glenoid, which is part of the scapula, your wing. And the other parts of the bone up above are the acromion, which is also part of the scapula, and the clavicle. So this is the glenohumeral joint, or the shoulder joint, and this is the acromioclavicular, or AC joint. So when people say they've separated their shoulder, they're usually talking about this joint. But when they say they've dislocated their shoulder, we're talking about this joint. So when you look at this, it looks like a ball in a socket. And if, then if we move up, you have the cartilage in the joint, both on the ball and also on the socket side. Then you have the joint lining. Then you have, over the top of that, you have the tendons. And most of you probably remember that tendons attach muscles to bones. Ligaments attach bones to bones. So you have a muscle belly here, but pay attention to where it hooks in on the far side of the ball as a tendon, because that's where most of the problem is that we'll be talking about tonight. And then sandwiched between the top of, and another important thing is there's a, a thickness to the tendon there. There's a dimension to it, which becomes more important as we go along as well. And, it's, and stop me if you have questions about things as we go. And then sandwiched on top of the tendons and under the bone, in between the two, is this blue structure, which is like a bag that acts as a cushion when you bring your arm up to protect uh, the tendons from this from this overlying bone there, and that's the bursa, correct? And then also what we see here is this big muscle on the outside, which is the deltoid muscle. You can all feel your deltoid muscle, and it's interesting to notice the direction of pull of this muscle. 
when this muscle contracts, it wants to pull that ball right up against that bone. And we'll talk about the significance of that as we go along. So um, when you look at it that way, it looks like a ball in a socket. But when we look at it this way, this is an MRI of a patient who's lying down. So their back is here, their front is up here. And it's what's called an axial cut or a transverse section through the shoulder, 90 degrees perpendicular to what we were looking at before. And here we see the, the ball, and then we see the socket, and it really is analogous to a golf ball sitting on a tee. So it's very unstable, it's inherently unstable. And one of the things that's important to think about in terms of the shoulder also is that, the, does anybody know the primary purpose of the shoulder? It's to put your hand where it needs to be, as opposed to your hips, which is an analogous joint, and that's designed to get you around. So a hip has a much deeper socket and a ball that's basically engaged. Here you can see that it's really not what we call a constrained joint. There's a lot of ball and very little socket, so it's very mobile. You can't, you're not supposed to be able to do this with your hips. Um, but because of that, uh, as I say, it's unsta inherently unstable. The mobility, the increased mobility, also imparts a lack of stability. So just in terms of the bony confines of the glenohumeral joint or the ball and socket joint of the shoulder, we're dependent on the soft tissues around it to stabilize it. And the, the different kinds of uh, stabilizers is there are static stabilizers and dynamic stabilizers. The static stabilizers are the ligaments and the cartilage in the joint. They're there. You don't have to think about firing them to impart some stability, but then around those static stabilizers, we have the dynamic stabilizers, and the ones we're going to focus on tonight are the rotator cuff muscles, and we can deal with those, so you call upon those to help with the stability. If you have a lack of static stability or static stabilizers, the ligaments, uh, then we're dependent really on the dynamic stabilizers to stabilize the joint. So on this view, we get a pretty good look at, at all four rotator cuff muscles, and the only way you can really accomplish that is in this position because the biggest and strongest one is a subscapularis, and that's in the front. Then you have three in series over the top and in the back. And those are the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. And I think it's also helpful to look at, at this part back here, because remember I mentioned muscles are attached to bones through tendons. So your rotator cuff muscles, three of the four, actually start back here. And that's why a lot of folks with rotator cuff problems will initially present with pain back here. So the muscle bellies are back on the wing back here. They then pass underneath these bones and then insert on the outside there. And their primary function, remember on the first anatomic drawing I showed, the direction of pull of the deltoid. When it contracts, it wants to jam that ball up against the bone up above it. So the function of the rotator cuff muscles is to center that ball in the socket because it wants to drift up because of the deltoid. So if your rotator cuff is incompetent, that's what, what happens. The ball rides up and it starts to wear out more because it's not meshing appropriately with, with the socket. And the other purpose of the rotator cuff muscles and tendons is to start your arm out to the side because the deltoid is basically pulling straight down and it can't bring you around the corner. So the rotator cuff starts your arm out to the side. When I say rotator cuff, I'm talking about all four of those muscles and tendons. So when it starts it out to the side, so then your big deltoid has a lever arm to bring your head up the rest of the way with, with good strength. And I put this in so you can also see the, the three of the four. And here, this is looking at the back of the shoulder. So, so the super, this is called the scapular spine. So the supraspinatus is above it, the infraspinatus is below it, and then you have what's called the teres minor there. But one of the reasons I showed this uh, drawing is because there are a lot of reasons people come in with pain in their shoulder. It's not always the rotator cuff. So when people say, oh, I had a friend, he had a rotator cuff there, or they had this, this, or this, and that didn't happen, this happened. There are a lot of different things going on, and I spend the better part of most days sorting out what is intrinsic shoulder pathology, a problem in the shoulder that's causing the pain. There are a lot of other things, nerve problems, that can refer pain to the shoulder. So that's just to remind us that there are other reasons you can have pain in your shoulder besides a rotator cuff. Here. 
there's really a severity spectrum of injury with regard to the rotator cuff also. Remember that on that first drawing also, the, ten, the top of the tendons and the undersurface of the bone, the acromion, is a very small space and interposed there is this sac that's now a little, showing a little bit bigger in the blue and that's the bursa. And if we look at the words, tendonitis and bursitis, itis means inflammation. So people who have tendonitis and bursitis usually do not relate it to a specific injury or a specific event. Um, and anatomically, it's really hard to distinguish the two, and to be honest with you, in terms of treatment, it doesn't really make a big difference because I don't think I've ever seen somebody with bursitis who didn't have tendonitis and vice versa. So we're treating that area, which is the tendons involved here, as well as the bursa up above it. Um, and again, usually or frequently, it's not associated with an injury. It's an inflammation. So that's on the, on the least it's on the minor end of the spectrum of injury of the rotator cuff. It's inflammation that hurts. These are folks who first notice that they go all the way up like this and it hurts. So the next time they only go to here, and then the next time they only go to here, and they start ratcheting down their motion because it's so uncomfortable. Pardon me, the other thing that hurts people with uh, tendonitis and bursitis frequently is when they're lying directly on their shoulder, and the pressure's coming in from the side here when you're lying on it, and that will exacerbate the symptoms as well. If we then move down the, uh, the spectrum of injury to the rotator cuff, so that's inflammation, the tendons are intact. The mechanism of injury, if you tear your rotator cuff, it's frequently but not always associated with an event. People can frequently say, oh, I remember I did that, I went off my bike. Uh, and the rotator cuff tendons, when the rotator cuff tears, with very few exceptions, it all, they always tear at the, ten, at the tendon, not in the muscle belt. So the tendon, and most commonly, the tendons pull out of the bone. And the way the tendons fail is either in tension, like this guy's injury, where the pull or the tension on it is stronger than the attachment to the bone, um, and it will pull out of the bone, or else the tendon itself, if you've had a long history of tendonitis, or calcium deposits or those sorts of things in the tendon itself is weak, it may fail within the tendon itself. So it can either be that, or again, you can fall directly on it, and you can, you can just by a, a blunt trauma, essentially, you can tear it that way. But I think most of them, of the acute tears, uh, happen more in tension than falling directly on it. So you can also have chronic tears or cumulative trauma. It's not one event, but it's doing, it's minor trauma to the tendon uh, over long periods of time, may or may not be associated with a specific injury. And then the really hard situations that we see are the, quote, acute on chronic. Somebody said, well, it's been a little bit uncomfortable for a couple of years. Maybe I did that back then, but it went away and I got better. And then I was at work and I was helping a patient and I lifted the patient and then my shoulder really hurt. And so that usually is a setting where they can date the time where their symptoms became much worse, but then if we get an MRI or if we do an arthroscopy or something like that, what we see is that those changes have been there for a long time. It's almost like the straw that broke the camel's back. The last few fibers let go, and, and there you have it. So you can have a combination of the two, chronic or acute, <coughs> chronic or acute. If we then look at tears, um, remember I emphasize the fact that there's a, a thickness or dimension to the tendons. There's a top surface, which is against the bursa, which we call the bursal side. And there's a bottom surface, which is adjacent to the joint, which we call it the articular side. So there's a thickness to the tendon. And I have 99% of the rotator cuff repairs I do, I do arthroscopically. So this is a view where the ball of the ball and socket joint is down here, my scope is up above, and I'm looking up at the tendon of the rotator cuff. And you can see that this is all frayed. It should be a very nice tendon hooking in there. And I think you can see that this is all frayed. And this is a shaver where I'm trying to define how thick that partial thickness tear is. These are far more common than a tear on the other side, or the bursal side. And this is, my arthroscope is now under that bone on the top, the acromion, and on top of the tendon. And you can see there's some tendon that's intact down here, but I'm actually lifting up a flap of tendon that's torn away from where it hooks into the bone. 
These are less common but much more symptomatic because, as, as I mentioned earlier, when you, when you bring your arm up overhead, and here's the supraspinatus tendon right here, and you have this bone up here, the acromion, and that flap or that partial thickness tear is right there. Every time it goes past that bone, it sort of tweaks it, it rubs it. So these are much more symptomatic than the articular side or the tear on the undersurface there, but not as common. And then, uh, so we, it can tear on the top, it can tear on the undersurface, or the whole thing can pull off. And these are even more common. So this is another arthroscopic view where my arthroscope is coming in from the side this way. So I'd be looking at the shoulder like this, and I'm underneath that bone, the acromion, and I'm on top of where the tendon, bless you, I'm on top of where the tendon's supposed to be, so if that tendon is intact, you can envision that I shouldn't be able to see into the joint there if the tendon's intact. But here I'm looking right at the bald head of the, uh, of the humeral head. So that means the tendon that's supposed to attach out here is pulled off. And in fact, not only is it pulled off, but it's actually migrated in toward the socket there. It's like a rubber band. When it lets go, it really moves away and it won't magically go back where it's supposed to be. <clears throat> if we then talk about treatments, <laughs> we obviously want to start with the least invasive treatments and then as we need to, go down the continuum of more invasive treatments. And the cornerstone of treating tendonitis, bursitis, and even partial thickness tears is physical therapy. And in addition to physical therapy, we can take NSAIDs or non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, and those are Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen, those and aspirin, uh, range of motion, and strengthening. And the other part of it, and we'll talk more about physical therapy in a bit, the other part of that is avoiding the things that you know make it worse. And for the most part, folks with rotator cuff problems are more bothered by working overhead for the anatomic reasons we just looked at. So that's, those are the first things that people stop doing when they, when they have rotator cuff problems, whether it's bursitis, tendonitis, partial thickness tears, or certainly full thickness tears. The other thing I neglected to mention with the, uh, with the partial thickness tears and the full thickness tears is the fact that not only are they uncomfortable in the mechanism of injury and everything, but you actually lose strength, you may lose range of motion, and they're uncomfortable. The hallmark of having a full thickness rotator cuff tear as opposed to tendonitis or a partial thickness tear is some people, after they tear, can't even lift the arm up. They have what's called pseudo paralysis, where the passive range of motion is maintained, but they can't, uh, they lose their, act, their active ability to lift it up there. So that's one of the hallmarks that I forgot to mention before. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between well, that and well, I, I mentioned earlier that when somebody's rotator cuff or bursa hurts, whether it's inflamed or certainly torn, and you reach up here, um, and the next time, and that hurts a lot, the next time you only go part of the way, and then you sort of ratchet it down. Well, remember the joint lining we talked about. As you lessen the excursion over which you're taking that ball within the socket, the joint lining contracts down. And so what happens is it's, it's manifest initially. It might, most of the folks I see usually manifest this way first. But the hallmark of a frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis is a loss of internal and external rotation. So most of the folks I see lose this first, and then they lose this. And that's a real tough thing to come back from. That's physical therapy, physical therapy, physical therapy. And it can take a year to recover. It's much more common in folks with diabetes than it is in the general population. So, yeah. so you just said frozen shoulder. How is that connected again? Is it, to a, is it is a rotator cuff no. a, the cause of a frozen shoulder or no? So these, the they're shoulder? different. So the rotator cuff again is the muscles and the tendons. Yeah. Frozen shoulder. The formal name for it is adhesive capsulitis. Yeah. The capsule is the joint lining. So anatomically they're distinct. However, I do see people who may have concurrent rotator cuff problems, whether it's tendonitis, bursitis, what we call impingement syndrome, yeah. who then ultimately may end up with adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. So anatomically they're distinct, but they may be related in terms of maladies that are bothering the shoulder. 
If we then think about injections, um, what we usually inject is a steroid. And we talked about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications being taken systemically. If we really want a powerful anti-inflammatory, we can put a steroid uh, right in that bursa. We don't inject the tendon, but we can put it in that bursa that's surrounding the tendon. Um, so it's the most potent anti-inflammatory. But, uh, and I think it's helpful in terms of bursitis and tendonitis and even sometimes in partial thickness rotator cuff tears. What it will do is it will allow you to become more, decrease, the, it's the inflammation that causes the discomfort. So if we can decrease the inflammation, whether it's oral anti-inflammatories or injections, it may allow you to participate more fully in physical therapy. And the effort then is designed to not repair rotator cuff fibers, but to augment the ones or allow you to strengthen the ones around where the tear is, that in a lot of people, that's enough to compensate for the fibers that are torn. So my indications for injection are bursitis, in concert with the physical therapy, um, is bursitis, tendonitis, and sometimes in partial thickness rotator cuff tears. Or if a patient says, I don't care if my rotator cuff is torn, I'm not going to have surgery, but I want to be more comfortable. Because the downside of injections is the steroids can actually weaken tissue. So if we use them, we do it judiciously and don't keep injecting people because that becomes uh, more of a problem than a benefit over time. Then when do we decide whether or not to, uh, to fix somebody's torn rotator cuff? Most of the people I see come because they're uncomfortable. Um, so that's, that's probably the primary driver. Uh, most of them have lost range of motion, and most of them are feeling weakness. The problem is if I see somebody, we treat a patient, we don't treat an MRI, and if I see somebody, uh, they're sent to me, a lot of folks I see have already had their own MRIs and everything, if they come in and I say, do you have pain? Yeah. How often? Well, if I do this or this, have you lost range of motion? No. Do you feel weak? No. Well, I can't really do better than that with surgery in terms of somebody's painless, that they maintain their range of motion, and they have good strength, with, but it's compensatory strength. It's not the fibers that are torn. I can't do better than that, and I tell them that. Then what I do is I review the precautions of things not, not to do working overhead, because that can make it worse. So those are the indications. So then how do we decide whether or not we can fix it? And then if so, how do we fix it? X-rays are great, but X-rays show us bone and relative positions of one bone to another. X-rays don't show us the soft tissues. In the old days, we would have what's called an arthrogram, where they would inject dye into your shoulder, and if it, very scientific, if it leaked out, it meant your rotator cuff was torn. <laughs> so, so it answered the question. It answered the question yes, no, but it didn't quantify the tear at all. We had no more information. You can also um, uh, determine whether or not you have a rotator cuff tear with an ultrasound, which is non-invasive. And, and we do that frequently. And again, that's if we want to know yes, no, in terms of making a decision about whether to inject somebody or something like that. We get the most information from an MRI, which is very good at showing us the detail of the soft tissues. It'll show us the size of the tear. Remember, there are four tendons there. So we need to have an idea of what the, you can have a great idea following a clinical examination so I usually have a differential diagnosis in my mind and then we confirm it or refute it with an MRI. So you can tear, tell the tear size and what we're concerned about with the tear size is how many tendons are torn. Usually what happens in my experience is that the first or the one most commonly torn is the supraspinatus, that one on the top. But there are two tendons behind that that all attach basically in the same place on the greater tuberosity. So the analogy I frequently use is that the hardest part of tearing a phone book in half is getting it started. Once you get it started, it's pretty easy to tear. So when that top tendon is torn, it imparts much greater stress on the subsequent two tendons. And studies have shown us over time that at least, at least a third of full thickness rotator cuff tears, if they're not treated, will get bigger over time. It may or may not become more symptomatic, and they definitely will become harder to so we pay attention to the tear size. Then we talk about retraction. Remember, it's like the, rep, the muscle attaches is connected to the tendon, which attaches to the bone. When it lets go, it recoils like a rubber band. So here's the end of the tendon right here. It's supposed to be out here. 
so there's a gap there. And we have to determine whether or not we're going to be able to, if we go in and do something surgical, bring this tendon back there to go, to go fishing for it. Now, I did four repeater cuff repairs today. <laughs> two of them were worse than this. One was, uh, and two were, were not as bad as, or were not as bad, or not as bad as this. Um, but we had an index of suspicion beforehand whether or not I thought I was going to be able to fix it. Another indicator that's very helpful in terms of deciding whether or not we can fix it is atrophy. So a muscle has to be attached at both ends to keep it strong. If it's detached from one end with a rotator cuff tear at the tendon, you can't strengthen it. So you get what's called atrophy. And after about 12 weeks or so, the changes that occur are irreversible to the fibers that are torn. So that's a consideration also. So if I, if I have a very big tear, a lot of retraction and a lot of atrophy, and this is all quantified, there, there are scales for each one of those things. And you put the information together and you say, yes, I think I can fix this, or I don't think we can fix it. We need to, we need to make another plan. So having this information ahead of time is very helpful in terms of, of figuring out what to do. And if we talk about surgical technique, probably 95 to 90 percent of the rotator cuff repairs I do are arthroscopic through small incisions uh, as an outpatient. And that's changed a lot. I remember when I did my fellowship at a fairly reputable place in Boston in 1985 and 1986. If we could get the shoulder in the or the scope in the shoulder, and if we could make another portal, and if we could actually use instruments, we were high five and all dead. So the you know, things have really changed over the last. To where we do the only things the only things that usually open now are total shoulder replacements and fractures. But the rest is done pretty much arthroscopically. So I was talking about the view before where we're looking from the side of the shoulder with an arthroscope. We're not we're not supposed to be able to see in here, but the tendon this tendon is sort of U-shaped like this. It's retracted way back over to the socket, and when I go in and pull on it, it stays there because it's been there for a long time. So what you have to do is put some stitches in the, in the stump that you can see. And then you actually have to free up on top of the tendon. Up on, this is the acromion, that bone up here. So with this device, what I do is I free up over the top. And this is the end of the tendon here. And then what I also have to do is it's stuck to the socket on the undersurface. So then what I have to do with this device, or a device like this, is this is the top of the socket. So I'm, Going, the tendon is here, so I'm going, the ball is down here, so I'm going with that device under here to sort of free up the undersurface. So I free up the top surface, and I free up the undersurface, and then and then get it to come out. But it's not always just a stump you're looking at. It can be split, which is what I'll show you on the next one here. So what I then have to do once I get it mobilized is I have to sort of close it like a zipper, uh, starting at the socket part of things. This is the edge of the tendon. And there's a back edge of the tendon also. So the socket was over here, and I'm, I'm sewing it side to side first. These are actually pretty good uh, bites of tendon there. And as I, as I sew it side to side, it's sort of like a zipper. I bring it down like this. But then when I get down here, I still have a gap right at the, right at the lateral edge where I need to attach it to the bone. Well, the bone's hard. I can't sew into the bone. So we actually have these devices, which are called anchors. This is actually a punch. Here's the ball. This is, I need to reattach this tissue back down to the bone. We don't want to drill because if we do, we take bone away and the bone gets soft. So we actually put this, it's like a punch that we put in, and then we screw in an anchor, uh, which is most of the ones I use now are plastic unless the bone is soft, and then I use a metallic anchor. So I put the anchor into the bone. It sits countersunk or recess below the surface of the bone, and it has these stitches coming out. So you can see. There's an anchor over here that's recessed below the bone, and there are four sutures there. This, I'm just putting this anchor in. When I pull this introducer out, we'll have four stitches over here. Then what I do is I weave the stitches uh, through the tendon with various different devices. It's sort of like building a ship in a bottle, because the cannula is about seven millimeters in diameter, and we have instruments that are long, so you're looking at a monitor uh, and doing it that way. And then we have to tie it down. You can't fingers are too big to do that, so we have instruments that we use to tie down inside, inside the shoulder, and then we're finished. So I do my part, and then the work begins.
I tell folks that the outcome, my, I do things pretty much the same way depending on what kind of a tear it is. I sort of have an idea about the way I like to do things, whether it's a dorsal sided tear, an articular sided tear, or a full thickness tear, or how big it is. So I think then it's, there are certain things patients need to do to help themselves. One is not to smoke, uh, and the other is to be compliant with physical therapy because Billy and his crew all know. You know, we have protocols, they know the precautions, they know how we do things. So this is the, probably the most important part, part of it, excuse me. We usually see people back in 10 days to two weeks after a repair, check the wound and everything, and usually for the most part, unless we have what's called a massive rotator cuff here, I will frequently get people moving in two weeks to four weeks, but it will be in a sling for anywhere from four to six weeks, depending on how big the tear is, and how I felt about the repair in terms of the tissue, the tendon, and the bone, how strong they are. So I would anticipate having people in a sling anywhere from four to six weeks, but we start therapy before that. You come out of the sling to bathe and to do the exercises, but other than that, you should ask folks to stay in the sling. And the emphasis in physical therapy is range of motion, range of motion, range of motion, because we have a golden period in which to get the motion back. You have the rest of your life to strengthen it. So we really focus on range of motion, and then we do strengthening, and it's a transition from spending more time with the therapist to then gradually, you know, doing more and more. So in the beginning, it's the therapist is this part, and you're here, and that reverses, that changes that proportion of being in here versus being at home, but you then still have to do your homework. And I usually tell folks that at about six months, you're probably 80% as good as you're going to be, but it takes a full year to get a steady state. And the reason I say it that way is people usually notice big differences up to the first uh, six months. Uh, then the differences are very subtle after that, but if they then reflect back, they'll say, yeah, I am a little more comfortable doing this. So at a, about a year, you usually pretty much where you want to be, in my opinion. So then, after we've done that, you've been through your therapy, you want to avoid the things I keep talking about, which is usually repetitive overhead resistance uh, is usually the enemy. You can, and people say, well, I want to you know, strengthen my deltoids and my chest and everything else. You can strengthen all of those muscle groups without doing a military press, an incline bench press, or flies. I think I've operated on the majority of New Hampshire and Vermont State Troopers because they all love to do flies. <laughs> and then you have to have reasonable expectations. I tell folks that my most important visit with a patient in my mind is, the, is what we call a preoperative visit. They're trying to take that away from me as they're telling us to see more and more people, but I'm trying to stay committed to that because I think it's the most important conversation to be sure that my patients and I are on the same page about what to expect after surgery. A person who has a massive retracted rotator cuff tear with a lot of atrophy, I need to be realistic with them about the fact that you're not going to end up like my Dartmouth football player with a rotator cuff who one day was fine, the next day had a rotator cuff tear, and the next day we fixed it. So we have to have the same expectations in terms of comfort, range of motion, and strength. Again, it's just the same things we, just, we uh, consider when we're talking about whether or not to, uh, to repair it. And then return to sports, you need to be reasonable about it. So um, throwing, I do have patients who go back to playing tennis, playing golf, skiing, throwing athletes. It's a little bit harder, but they do get back. So. After you've sewn it down and anchored it, does does it is the anchor withholding it forever or does it grow back? That's a good point. So on that slide that I showed where the punch was going into the bone, before I do that, I shave down the stump. When it pulled away, there's usually a stump of tendon there. Um, so I have a device, a shaver, where we prepare what we call the footprint where it's supposed to be. So we shave that down to a good bleeding bone. And then we put the anchors in. Then we pass the sutures and tie it down. So the initial strength of the repair is imparted by the anchor and the sutures in the tendon. But I also prepare the stump of the tendon to good bleeding tissue. So then the job of the, of the anchor and the sutures is to hold it in place so that you can get ingrowth of blood vessels and get healing that way. So it proportionally, initially, it's all anchor and sutures, and then at a year, it's hopefully you've, you've done it yourself. 
You mentioned using ibuprofen and other NSAIDs. Um, isn't there some evidence that the use of that over time actually weakens ligaments? Well, actually, we don't. I said in, in terms of tendonitis and bursitis and maybe partial thickness tears, we actually ask our patients not to take NSAIDs uh, after surgery because there, there is evidence that, that uh, NSAIDs will impair healing of tendons to bone and actually, but we don't like patients with fractures to take them either. So just to, to clarify, so it impairs healing, I get that. Is there any evidence that it actually weakens the tissue itself? I'm not aware of any evidence that it weakens, that they weaken tissue. Okay. Steroids do, okay. but not non-steroids as far as I know in terms of the way they work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Would a steroid that's on through the patch, the electric, I don't know what it's called. Iontophoresis? Yeah. Or, or tendons? I don't think that they damage tendons that way, no. They, they still, the idea is that they still decrease inflammation uh, transcutaneously, but we can actually pro probably talk about that more than I can. And the other thing I wanted to ask is, you said that this is a lot brought on by inflammation, the tendonitis and the eye that is inflammation. Yeah. And do you ever um, recommend a low inflammatory diet? And, like foods, there are certain foods that are supposed to be anti-inflammatory, you know, like ginger and the cytochemicals and fruits and vegetables, and then the mega six is that are or the out of balance inflammatory. I'm just curious. No, I'm all in favor of a holistic, multi-dimensional approach to any of these problems. I don't know enough about them to say, here, you should be taking this. Right. I know stuff that I take, but uh, yeah. I don't know enough to you know, suggest to my patients that they do, but I, I, think they can, I don't think they hurt. Sure. So when you're thinking about a spectrum that where the shoulder injuries, um, or a spectrum of shoulder injuries, so when people have the initial kind of, you're talking about the bursitis or the tendonitis of the, the uncomfortableness, maybe with a range of motion. It seemed like you were saying, as long as there's not a tear, as long as it's just kind of an inflammation, so there's the bursitis or tendonitis, maybe the first thing to do is stop doing overhead things. But you need to be keeping your range of motion as much as you can, so how do you balance that so that you don't kind of push it to the point where you have a tear, well now, you, now there's a fix. It's almost like it seems like in a way, <coughs> Once there's a tear, then actually there's a fix, but prior to that, it's just kind of uncomfortable and you have to just accept that maybe you aren't going to have the range of motion you did. So what do you maybe, think? It, maybe it's helpful. One of the things I try to do is to, is to grossly lump problems into things that are hurtful and things that are harmful. So tendonitis and bursitis are hurtful, but they're not harmful. And it's okay for you to maintain your, regardless of what you have, I encourage people to maintain range of motion, even if it's uncomfortable, because once you start to lose that, you can end up with adhesive capsulitis. So I do think it's important, to, and there's also a difference between maintaining your motion and lifting <coughs> weights to do that. So I think it's important when you have itis, inflammation, tendonitis, bursitis, to maintain your motion. I don't mean, I didn't mean to imply that you should stop <coughs> moving it, but we do know that repetitive overhead lifting, which is not, you know, putting something up on a shelf, but actually doing military press and those sorts of things will, will frequently make people worse. So I think you should, uh, and, and the other thing is, that's not all, uh, non-steroidals and physical therapy injections are not all we do for tendonitis and bursitis too. If it persists in spite of doing those things, again on that spectrum of treatment, least invasive to most invasive, I also operate on people's shoulders who don't have partial thickness or full thickness rotator cuff tears, if they have what's called impingement, the bursitis that just persists will not go away. But I think it's important to be sure most patients or many patients will benefit by the less invasive treatments, and I think everybody deserves that opportunity before I do what I think is really fun to arthroscope people. So, and and the, the vast majority of people get better without that. This is the end, uh, you know, when I operate, but it's the beginning of the therapy. Are there exercises that might help prevent all of that? Yeah. Um, so the, the important thing to do and what people emphasize in therapy is, is sort of the opposite of what makes it worse, which is this. So we usually focus on what's called adduction coming down and internal rotation. And the other part of it is to focus on 
the socket part of the scapula is sort of a platform. And we work on, a lot of folks are like this, which is called scapular ptosis, which sort of is a disaster for the ball and socket part of the joint, the rotator cuff and the bursa. So we really focus on, on strengthening the upper back and, the, and what we call scapular stabilization. Um, so, and then also coming down and coming in as opposed to up and out. Mm -hmm. uh, those are things that are helpful to do. Um, I had told you should uh, total shoulder replacement um, like six and five and a half years ago mm -hmm. um, and we had before I moved up here. Mm -hmm. My question is whether I have a titanium ball in the front case of the problem as well. If I don't um, do anything that they said I couldn't do, like not back to tennis or squash, um, is there a danger of prosthesis loosening mm -hmm. just from without abusing mm -hmm. it? Yeah, and that's the, as you obviously know, that's the weak point in the whole system is the glue between the socket and the bone. What causes it to weaken? To weaken? Is it, uh, you mentioned that to loosen, you said to loosen. Would it loosen, would the prosthesis loosen without my doing anything that I've been doing? The incidence of loosening for the ball side is less than 1%, whether it's glued in or not glued in. The incidence of loosening on the socket side is about 11%. That's the weak link in the whole construct usually. And it's much more common if your rotator cuff is incompetent. In fact, having an incompetent rotator cuff is a contraindication to doing a total shoulder. If you have injured your shoulder, like if it's a partial, a little teeny tiny part of the of either the tendon or I guess muscles also, do they ever grow back? The part that's torn will not. But as I mentioned, one of the parts of, about therapy, getting people comfortable to do therapy, in a lot of people, you can, uh, the, uh, the fibers that are around it that are intact mm -hmm. can get stronger to compensate for the ones that are deficient. But the ones that are pulled away from the bone will not go back and heal. They'll scar side by side, but they won't actually reconstitute where they're supposed to be. Is the level of pain uh, experienced with rotator cuff is usually most severe, or I mean, can you, does it suggest what you really need to have? Have you seen or not? I mean, what would be the level of pain? To have it repaired? So what would be the level of pain you might experience when I'll say a pool chair probably pretty severe versus just a um, few fibers? Um, yeah. If, and when do you need to see a doctor? I mean, can you, is there a sort of area where you could just uh, take some kind of a measure like your very yep. range of motion? No, that's a good question. When, you, when do you pull the trigger, sort of? Yeah. Um, if you're having discomfort, that's one thing. If you're starting to lose range of motion and it's compromising what you do, that's another thing. If you can't lift your arm up, then it's either your rotator cuff is torn or you have a neurologic problem, usually with the brachial plexus, which is a group of muscles in there. But that's, it's, it's hard to say. We don't know how many people are out there, but I'm sure a lot, with full thickness rotator cuff tears who are doing okay. It just so happens I see the ones who aren't. But there are an awful lot of people, we know from cadaver studies, that there are a lot of people, when they do a post-mortem exam on them, oh, look, yeah, both sides torn, but never complained or anything else. So they, are, they aren't always symptomatic. If it's associated with an injury, frequently it is, is symptomatic, but it might not necessarily be. So if you have pain, you're losing range of motion, and you have weakness, then I think it's probably worth pursuing. doesn't mean coming to see an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, primary care folks see tons of people with Impingement syndrome, bursitis, tendonitis, and those sorts of things. Um, it doesn't mean you have to have you know, something invasive like that. So, at what point, from you start with the primary care, you have an injury, you go and see your doctor, they tell you to do physical therapy. And now, yesterday I'm four weeks out from physical therapy, and you're at a certain progress, and um, I have never heard anybody say this 12-week window that you had spoke of earlier, and so in four months of recovery, I've never heard that before, and I've never had an MRI, and don't actually know the extent of the injury, so at what point then do you say to your doctor, I'm 80%, but if I had seen somebody in 12 weeks and had an MRI, maybe I could have been 100%, and 
That's I'm right. a professional and I do body work and I also provide that care with other people, so I kind of want to know what to tell them, you know, my patients and also moving forward with my recovery. At what point do you say, okay, well, where's the orthopedic person and where's the MRI? That's a really hard um, question to answer because it, it's so variable. I guess the, the way I think about it is if, uh, if you're seeing somebody and you're being treated, if you're improving with the regimen, or if you plateau at a level that's acceptable to what you do, then stay the course. But if you start getting worse, or if you plateau at a level, well, if you never do anything with your shoulder, probably doesn't hurt. But if you plateau at a level that's unacceptable to you, then I think you should go to the next step. And that's why I try to present it as least invasive to most invasive. It may be a matter of anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, avoiding the things that hurt. That's not working, okay. My practice, um, I usually, I think probably almost never, will inject somebody's shoulder until I know whether or not the rotator cuff is torn. So I don't go to that, I don't go beyond the PT, the anti-inflammatories and avoidance, I don't go to the next step in my practice without knowing that. A lot of my patients and clients say injury, they don't say tear. That's what well, that's the spectrum. Yeah. Injury is from inflammation to fraying or tendinopathy to a partial tear to a full tear. And that's, that's all rotator cuff injury. That's why it's so hard when people say, well, I had a friend who had a surgery done. He was in a sling for three days, and then he was out playing tennis. <laughs> His repair is going to fail if he did. <laughs> <laughs> I never, those of you who have seen me know that when I see somebody in the office, I see a lot of second, third, fourth opinions. And people sometimes when they see me get a little bit angry when I walk in and I sit down and I start from the beginning. I don't look at anything that anybody else has written. I don't look at, people say, did you look at my MRI? No. So by the time I've talked to you, or listened to you, I should say, and I've examined you, I pretty much have a good idea of one or two or three differential diagnoses and then we figure out together how to pursue those. But adhesive capsulitis is definitely a clinical examination. You can see changes on an MRI, but you can't hang your hat on the diagnosis based on an MRI for that. Thanks.